Greetings, everyone. It's Professor Fiore, and we're back with more embedded C programming. Yay! In this video, we're going to look at looping, how we can get the computer to do something over and over and over again. So as an example, suppose you have a reactive circuit, like an RC circuit, let's say, and uh, you want to do a Bode plot for it. So you might do a computation at a specific frequency, calculate the capacitive reactance and so forth, you know, find a current voltage, whatever it is you're interested in, and then go back, change that frequency, update it, increase it, do the computation again, then repeat the process, increase the frequency again, do it again. So eventually you can have data points from, you know, some low frequency to some high frequency, then you can connect the dots, so to speak, and get yourself a nice little Bode plot. So computers are really good at this. You just have to give it the instruction, the template to do once, and then we iterate the thing. So the way we would approach looping in C, there are three structures, really two primary ones that we, we are gonna look at here. There is the while loop, there is the do while loop, which is really just a very minor sort of variation on a while loop, and then the for loop. So let's start with the while loop. This is somewhat reminiscent of an if statement in that we have a sort of a test condition right here. And just like in an if, we're going to see if that's true. So while whatever this is, is true, we're going to go and execute whatever this code in here happens to be. As long as this is true, this just keeps on going. Okay, remember what true means, non-zero. So you could do something like this. While one, well, this is always true, it never changes. This is a forever loop, it goes forever. Now that might seem like it's kind of crazy, but it turns out that's extraordinarily useful. Um, in virtually all embedded programs, you have something to do that does this. It basically, in, inside here, is looking for inputs. It's looking for things that happen. You know, the user pushes a button or a sensor, you know, goes above a threshold or something like that. So the thing is just constantly scanning. Now, in our case, instead of just looking at this forever loop, we're going to look at, uh, you know, different kinds of variables. Like we could say, well, look, you know, while A is true, in other words, while A is non-zero, or you could say while A is less than B, or while A is, uh, you know, less than 10, or while A is less than 10, and, you know, B is 12, okay, something like that. Um, just to make it a little bit more obvious, what I'm trying to do here. Now, as long as both of these things are true, you know, if A is 6 and B is 12, this thing will just keep on running. And so you can have a very complicated sort of expression in here. As long as it's true, this thing just keeps on running. Now, the do while is essentially the same sort of deal, except that it's structured with do first. So it's like this. Then we have the braces. I'm just going to do this on one line because I'm going to erase it really quick. And then there's the while after it, like so. So the, the real difference here is that the do while always runs at least once because it goes do and then you do this and then it checks the while. Over here, you know, if, if the um, test condition is false initially, then you never do the loop. Now, in all my years of programming, decades of programming, I've probably used a do while twice. And the while seem to do everything you need to do. All right. So there's three things to deal with inside the while loop. There's, generally speaking, going to be some kind of variable initialization, right? There's going to be an initialization value for it. Then it's got to change somehow. There's got to be some kind of dynamic element, maybe in a simple increment. Maybe it's the result of a more complicated, uh, you know, computation, let's say. And then there has to be um, a test for finality. In other words, where it finishes. Where's the stop test, right? The end test. We need all three things. 
So very quickly, you know, we could have a variable. I'll, I'll dispense with uh, defining the variables. Let's just say we have a variable a. Um, I might initialize this to zero and say while a is, you know, less than 10, do stuff, you know, whatever stuff happens to be. And when you're all done, we'll increment that value. So I might say, okay, a gets a plus one. So what's this going to do? All right. So for right here, I'll just, I'll just put in a sort of a bogus print statement here. All right. I tell you what, we'll, we'll just, um, just skip a line. How's that? So this starts off at zero. Initially it is zero. So this is true. It skips a line, increments a. So it takes the current value of a, zero, adds one to it. Now it's one, overwrites the existing value. So now a is one. We come back up here. Is a still less than 10? Yeah, it's one. Okay, skip your line, take the current value one, add one to it. Now it's two. So a is two. Is it still less than zero or less than 10? Yes, it is. Okay, skip a line, add one to it. Now it's three. Still less than 10? Yes, it is. So this is just banging through here and we're just skipping lines from this sort of bogus printf. Eventually, you know, we get up to nine. A is nine, right? We do this. Nine plus one is 10. Is A less than 10? No, it's not. So this fails and we pick up right here, right? So whatever's after that, you know, right here, that's what we jump to basically, right? So as long as this is true, this thing just keeps sort of spinning through here. Now, if you didn't have the increment, you could see you're going to wind up with an infinite loop. It's just going to go forever. This thing will just keep, you know, skipping lines, basically. Uh, if you didn't increment it uh, properly, you know, you could, you could do this. Now it's just getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So it's always going to be less than 10, right? Until eventually at some point, you know, we'll, we'll sort of count down the negative values until it wraps around, you know, there's an integer, integer limit here, it wraps around to a huge positive value, and then it'll fail, but it's probably not what you want to happen, right? Uh, so we also have to watch for um, the termination, I got to get the termination correctly, and I have to have the initialization correct too, right? Those three things, we're always concerned about those, right? Those three things are important. Now, because we do this sort of thing, this a is equal to a plus one a lot. Like I have a loop where I say, you know, I need to do this 10 times. There are different ways of doing this. So we could say a gets a plus one. A shorthand way of saying this is a plus equals one. All right, let's be nice and put my semicolons in here. So basically the way this works is you just imagine this first part to a plus. You just imagine that as being on the other side of the equal sign. So it's like a equals gets a plus one, right? You can do this with um, like a multiply as well. So if you wanted to do a, a, let's say, I don't know, times two, right? You could also say it as um, a times equals two, right? So you get the idea. So there's the like a times and there's the a times, okay? So the while loop here is really flexible that you can do all kinds of crazy stuff over here for the increment. Like I said, right? You could add one, subtract one, you could add five, you could subtract 27, you could multiply it by two, you could take the square root of it, you could do all kinds of crazy stuff. It could be the result of a um, very complex computation. Um, this simple idea of incrementing though, just adding one is, is so common that there is a really good shortcut for this, which is called the increment operator, you can just say a plus plus. So that just adds one to it. There is also a decrement operator, which is a minus minus. Now to be really complete about this, that's properly referred to as the post increment operator. It basically means get the next one. Okay, bump it to the next one. And that's really where the name C plus plus comes from. It's sort of a programmer's joke. C plus plus is the you know, literally the next C. So, you know, first came C language, then came C++. Um, yeah, not terribly funny, but there you go. 
programmers are good at programming. They're not stand-up comics. So there's a, a variation on this called a pre-increment operator. And there's also a pre-decrement. There's a minus minus A. What's the difference between these two things, right? A plus plus and A minus, uh, excuse me, and, and plus plus A. Because they appear to do the same thing. They just add one to A. Well, in a larger context, if this was part of a, a larger assignment, it does make a difference. This does whatever the expression is. The last thing it does is increment A. In this case, it increments A first, and then it does whatever it needs to do. So I'll give you a couple real quick examples. So if I had some variable I, and I said I gets A++ plus plus versus I gets plus plus A, if A is initially 2, all right, and in this version, you print out, hey, what's I? You know, like right here, you print out what I is. Well, what this does is it assigns the value of A to I. So I is 2. Then it increments A. So if you print it right here, I would be 2. A would be 3. But if you did it this way, what it would do is it would increment A first. In other words, it would go to 3 and then it would assign to i. In other words, in this version, both i and a would be 3. Right? So in this version, i is 2, a is 3 when you're done. In this version, both i and a are 3. So they, it makes a difference. All right. So however you want to do that. So like I said, back here, you could either do this, a is equal to a plus 1, a plus equals 1, or you could just do... A++. Plus plus. All right. Okay, cool. Because we have the situation where um, we want to do something a specific number of times, like I want to do this loop 15 times, or if I know explicitly where I'm starting, where I'm going, and how I'm getting there, there's another uh, looping structure, the for loop, which conveniently puts all of this in one spot. And it looks like this. So here we basically have all three things. We would have your start condition first. So if I was going to replicate this thing, I would say, OK, let's start A at 0. Then a semicolon. And this is going to be the terminator. OK, I'm going to start at A. Where am I going to? Um, you know, as long as A is less than 10. And how am I getting there? What's my increment value? Well, I'm going to add 1 to it each time, so I can just say A++. plus plus. So this loop here is functionally identical to declaring the A, doing the test, and doing the increment. You have all three of them in one spot. So you're, you're not likely to forget, right? It's, you know, a classic beginner's error when you're doing this while loop to forget the increment. And like I said, we wind up with an infinite loop over here. That's not going to be the case here. I mean, you got these three separate things, and you're most likely going to remember how that works. All right. Now, there are there are other things you can do. You can, um, some people go crazy with this. I'm not a fan, but you can have other initializations, like you can say, oh, B is 12, and, you know, so on and so forth. You can have multiple things going on here, All right? You know, let's also increment C. When you do that, you just use commas. I think that kind of obfuscates the loop. You know, it's not obvious necessarily what's going on. And if you really only have one control variable, then just do that. And if you have other variables, you know, just have separate statements for them. Clarity in programming is very important. All right? You don't want to do something because you. Oh, I think it looks cool. If it, if it obscures what you're trying to do. You know, studies have shown that uh, a huge percentage of programming effort is updating code, right? Getting rid of bugs, putting in new features. So you might not be the person doing that. Somebody else might be doing that, which means you might be doing somebody else's code. 
you know, the, the idea of having appropriate documentation and clear code, really, really important. All right, so now we got an idea of how these loops work. So let's go down to look at an example. All right, so here's a typical, you know, minimally use of useful program. Um, basically what this thing does is it creates a table. So this is just an Ohm's law, power law thing. Um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna ask the user for a starting voltage, an ending voltage, and then a voltage increment, and then a resistance value. So we're just gonna place this voltage across the resistance then it's going to calculate the current and the power and print them out in the form of a table. So you know, obviously we've got the printf, scanf pairs, the four things that we're going to need. Right, these are all doubles. Notice they're all percent LFs. And don't forget those ampersands. This line is the heading of the table. Okay, now instead of just putting the words in here, notice I've used this percent minus 15s. So these are strings. Here's the strings we're going to print. Voltage, current, power. And by using the percent minus 15, the minus sign is left justified. This is going to give us 15 spaces, so I can control my spacing really nice. And then here's the loop. Here's the action. So V, the voltage of interest, is going to start at V start, right, what we got back here. It's going to continue as long as it's no bigger than the stop voltage, which we got here. And we're going to add this voltage, the increment, to it each time. We calculate the current based on Ohm's law. We calculate the power based on power law. And then we print these three, three things out. Notice I'm using, again, minus 15 for my space, so it matches up. I'm using G, which is the smaller of E or F, right? And then here's my three very important um, parameters. How's that? To be printed out. And finally, just to give us a little out space, I have another print F here just to give us a new line. Okay, so let's give this a run. Okay, enter the starting voltage. So let's just start this at 10 volts. I'm gonna run this to 20. And I'm gonna do a two volt increment. So this should go 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20. And then the resistance value, I'm gonna use a standard 220 ohm resistor. Okay, there we go. All right, so there's my heading, volts, currents. So, burp, 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 burp. All right, perfect. Nicely spaced, here's the voltages. 10, going up by 2, to, right, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20. And then here's the appropriate currents. Right, we can see these going up twice the voltage, twice the current. And then here's the appropriate powers. And notice the, um, the uh, square law effect here, right? We basically double the voltage, but the power goes up by 2 squared. Okay, so kind of cool. So you can sort of play with that if you're interested. Um, but it ties together a bunch of the things we've been doing, right? We've got our printfs, scanfs, got our little loop over here, different kinds of um, formatting things for the print. Okay, so I think that pretty much covers it. What's next on our hit parade? Well, the next thing we're gonna look at um, is pointers and addresses. And to deal with some of this, some of the applications require loops scanning through arrays, for example, there's a nice sort of duality between pointers and arrays, which we'll also take a look at. See you next time.